Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 76 of the podcast. And this week, I received a great email from Brenda, and she asked about the difference between long arms and mid arms, uh, what you should be thinking about and asking yourself whenever you're thinking about purchasing a big machine like this, and also any additional features. So here's her email just to start out. She said, hi, I am beginning research on buying a long arm quilting machine and I could really use some insight of what to look for. I know the first decision is probably long arm versus mid arm, but then what after that? There are so many options. What are the standard options? What are preferred? Help. And then P.S. she said, love, love, love the YouTube videos. Thanks for teaching and making the quilting world nicer. And thank you so much for that, Brenda. Super, super sweet to get your message this week. So this is a very big question. And as I started thinking about it and uh, kind of going over my thought process of uh, you know, the decision to get into long arm quilting, uh, the decision of what style of machine to buy, this is a pretty big topic. So I think the very first thing that you need to start off with is asking yourself three questions. The first question is what type of quilt do you want to make the most? So do you wanna make bed quilts or do you wanna make show quilts? Do you wanna make quilts that hang on a wall or do you wanna make quilts that you cuddle with on the couch? Do you wanna make quilts as gifts for people that you love? Do you wanna make quilts for charity? What is your priority? And I know this is sometimes hard. I, I have a hard time sometimes putting myself into a corner and saying, this is what I wanna make and only this, you know? but generally you need to have an idea of what you're mostly going to be creating. Now that's not to say that you can never go create a wall hanging if you decide that you really want to make bed quilts or you can never go make a bed quilt if you really want to make wall hangings. But a long arm, what it's specifically designed to do, it is designed to quilt big and it is designed to quilt faster. And the reason is you can make nice big sweeping movements with a long arm on a frame that is actually very tricky to do on a home machine set up in a table. So if your emphasis and your desire is to quilt charity quilts, bed quilts, quilts for the couch or just to cuddle up with, baby quilts, any of those things that are pretty much openly quilted, not densely quilted, that are um, very soft and cuddly. And you don't need a lot of quilting on this style of quilt. And a long arm is going to help you get those quilts quilted more quickly with less strain on your body, with less strain on your neck, your shoulders, your arms, all that good stuff, because you are standing and moving the machine. You are not setting and pushing the quilt under the needle. The difference of physicality is, it, it is something to definitely think about uh, because you know, pushing a big quilt through the arm of a small machine. So right here I have the Eversone Sparrow 20. This is a six inch harp. You know, that's a small space to be fitting the, the quilt into that area and guiding it around. It is so much easier physically to move the machine instead. But that being said, it is easier to make big sweeping movements with the long arm. It is not as easy to make tiny, itsy bitsy, controlled, precise movements with the long arm, like micro stippling. I'm still struggling to stitch <laughs> micro stippling and all my micro designs that are really easy to do on my home machine. They're a lot harder to do on the long arm because that requires really fine tuned control and precision here. That's a little bit more of a struggle. Now, does that mean it's impossible? No, it's just simply going to require a little bit more practice, but that does not mean in any way that it's impossible to get the hang up. Uh, just simply that the long arm is best at quilting big, at covering the quilt uh, with open quilting very quickly. Okay, so that's the first thing to really ask yourself. What is your focus with quilting? And what do you mostly want to make? And I really want you to be honest with yourself and really think through that, think through all the permutations. Right now, you're wanting to make bed quilts. That's awesome. Now the next question, how many quilts? 
in a fantasy world, <laughs> in a fantasy world, if you had unlimited amounts of time, how many quilts would you be producing on a monthly basis? So do you wanna be making one quilt per month or two quilts per month? Do you have a charity in mind that you would like to be donating five or 10 quilts every month? Because this is something that you could conceivably do with a long arm. You could conceivably be uh, producing a lot faster. Uh, now it really comes down to your piecing. You know, if you have a really complex piecing design, then obviously that's gonna take more time, but it's going to significantly speed up your quilting because again, you're moving the machine, you're not pushing the quilt in the arm. So speed is important. I would say if you're wanting to make, you know, one or two quilts a year, then there's really no advantage to getting a long arm. It's a big expense. And one or two quilts a year is definitely something that you could do on a home sewing machine. Even quilting bed quilt style with big sweeping movements with very minimal quilting, you could do that on your home machine just fine. You're just going to need to take more breaks and watch out for any physical issues that come along with that. But that's absolutely possible. I would say, this question, how many quilts do you wanna make, is really designed to gauge how serious you are about this, where you're wanting to go with it. And if you know that you want to minimum be finishing and quilting and, and actually going from start to finish completely on a quilt in one month or less, that's when I would say you're at the level, you're taking your craft very seriously. This is no, probably no longer really a hobby for you. You're wanting to take that extra investment. And I would say, yes, a long arm is absolutely worth it at that stage. I stayed on a home machine, just, just for reference here, I stayed on my home machine happily for more than 10 years. I started quilting in 2005. I only started playing with long arms in 2016. So keep this in mind, you know, you can stay on a home machine for a very, very long time. That's a-okay. The only thing to keep in mind is it is slower, and it could have some physical impact in your body. Now, the question about mid arms versus long arms is really interesting. And it's one of those pet peeves of mine, I'll be completely honest, I don't use the word mid arm. And the reason is mid arm is a very confusing term. And it's something that's kind of cropped up within the last five years or so in quilting. And I don't like it. And I don't use that term because it's so confusing. In my opinion, there are two different types of machines. There is a long arm, and you know a long arm because it has wheels, it rolls. You also know a long arm because it does not have feed dogs. So if you're looking at a long arm and you see the foot, underneath the foot is a solid metal plate. There are no little teeth. There is nothing moving there. Whenever the machine is running and the needle is going up and down, there is nothing on this plate that is moving. It is a solid metal plate. That means it has no feed dogs. It has no feeding mechanism. For that reason, you can never do piecing on a long arm. You cannot use it like a traditional machine. And you also cannot do anything like walking foot quilting. The only thing that you can do on a long arm, whether it's a rail mounted long arm, a frame mounted long arm like you see right here, or it's a table mounted long arm it's set up in a table. The only thing that you can do on that style of machine because it doesn't have feed dogs is free motion quilting and ruler foot quilting. That's it. So it's a very specific machine. It does a very specific thing. Uh, keep that in mind. Whenever you're looking at this, you're not going to be getting, you know, something that you can do with, you know, anything with piecing. Even if you have it table mounted, it's not a piecing machine. This is specifically for free motion quilting and ruler foot quilting. Now a home machine is obviously different. A home machine is a home machine. <laughs> It's the machine that you grew up with. You probably saw a lot. It is the machine that everyone knows. We can easily recognize it because it's got this basic shape. Even the more expensive machines still have this very basic shape with the motor on the right-hand side. You've got a hand wheel. You've got a needle that goes up and down. You've got interchangeable feet. And underneath that foot is the feed dogs. And those are the little metal teeth 
that go up and down. They feed your fabric forward, and that way you're gonna create the perfectly even spaced stitches. So, a home machine, this is what's confusing. People started using the term mid-arm to refer to semi-industrial home machines that have a bigger motor and are built rugged and tough and designed to stitch faster and designed a lot more stripped down. They're usually lock stitch, which means the needle only goes up and down. Lock stitch machines that have very basic functions but a high powered motor. So those machines started being called mid-arms, but they still have feed dogs. So technically that machine is not a long arm. It's not, it's not anything different from a home machine except for the high powered motor, the lock stitch function of needle only going up and down, and you know the ability to stitch faster. So please don't be confused. This is kind of clever marketing on the part of machine manufacturers. You know, they want to convince you that here's this machine that's different that's going to help you do your machine quilting. And it certainly can. However, that machine still has the limitations of a home machine. It's still got a small harp space. It's not a massive amount of space in the arm. It's also still got the same limitations of pushing the quilt through the arm of the machine. Again, not impossible and you can absolutely do it, but keep this in mind. That is still a lot of physicality moving and manipulating the quilt versus a long arm on a frame, which is a lot easier. It is physically a lot easier to do that. This is my opinion. And I'll be honest, if I was shooting this podcast five years ago, it would have been a very different story because I didn't have a long arm. I had never really quilted on a frame. I had a very stuck mentality about what that was and what that meant. And you know, it really, you need to break this down a lot less emotionally and look at it very simply. These are simply machines. And just like I've got a power drill out in my barn <laughs> that I enjoy using a lot more than a screwdriver for the same job, these machines do specific things really, really well. They help you speed up, they help you do the job easier and faster, and that's the benefit. The other confusing thing about mid-arms is sometimes people think that that refers to the depth of the arm. So how big the arm is on the long arm. And a lot of times people will look at the Grace Cunique 14 plus or 15 R and say, oh, that's a mid-arm because it's got a small arm. And that's where I think the confusion lies in. It does mid-arm mean a semi-industrial lock stitch, a, a needle up, needle down, whole machine with feed dogs, or does it mean a smaller long arm? I find that really confusing. And there's really only two different types of machines. There's long arms that don't have feed dogs, and there's home machines that do have feed dogs. And home machines, of course, can piece, they can do walking foot quilting, free motion quilting, ruler foot quilting, plus everything a normal home machine can do, you know, decorative stitches and uh, piecing garments and piecing quilts and all that good stuff. So even if you have a long arm, you're still going to need a home machine to actually make your quilts. So you gotta keep that in mind too. Now, the biggest thing about those semi-industrial lock stitch machines, the, the so-called mid-arms that I find the most uh, aggravating is that uh, they're coming in at that perfect price point for quilters. And this is really your third question that you really need to be asking yourself when you're considering investing in a long arm, and that is your budget. So those uh, mid-arm machines, those popular machines, are coming in around $800 to $1,000, and that seems like a great price point. Now, I would say if you're gonna take that machine and put it on a frame, you're probably going to see that increase in speed. You're going to see that increase in movement. Now, because the harp is so small, you're not going to see a lot of increase in speed because no matter what frame you put it on, that's gonna take up a lot of space within the open area of that machine. So you're gonna be advancing the quilt in little increments. So you might have like two to four inches to quilt in. And so you'll quilt those two to four inches and then advance the quilt through. So it's not a lot of space to be quilting in, but that would still be moving the machine over the quilt 
instead of moving the quilt under the needle. And Grace Company did just recently release a hoop frame that is designed to do exactly that. Uh, it is designed to take any home machine and you can put it on the frame and be able to quilt on your home machine on a frame. Now, the space that the frame takes up is very small. It's only four feet wide. And you're probably only gonna need about 30 to 40 inches deep for the frame to go as well. So it takes up a much smaller footprint. I actually did some measuring and realized that takes up a smaller footprint than my typical home sewing machine set up in a table because how I set my machines up in a table, I always have extra tables all around it to take the weight of the quilt, you know, to keep it all on a flush surface. So the hoop frame is a good option, particularly if you're interested, if you're wanting to see if you wanna get into it. But I'd say that's very, very, it's going to be very entry level. Uh, working on your home machine is obviously still not going to be uh, as fast and the higher speeds that you can get on a long arm. You're also gonna have a smaller space to quilt into. So you might advance the quilt and then you have about a four inch space to stitch into, you fill that up pretty quickly. So what might end up is you might end up feeling like you're adjusting the quilt more than you're actually quilting because you're constantly having to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, roll it up and push it through the frame. So keep that in mind. There are always going to be advantages and disadvantages, no matter what machine you're using. It's a tool. That's how they work. I have a bandsaw out in my barn that has advantages and disadvantages over the radial arm saw that I've got. You know, this is just how machines work. Now, when you're talking price point on a long arm, a lot of people instantly think $20,000. And I'd say five to 10 years ago, that's definitely what you would be talking. It was a solid investment into your quilting hobby, usually as you transformed it into a business, because that is a significant amount of money to be putting down. Usually the people that were buying long arms were more advanced quilters that were wanting to start long arm quilting for other people. So $20,000 small business loan, you know, was typically a way that quilters were getting into business. Well, things change, prices come down. And now this setup, I'm on the uh, Grace Cunique 14 Plus, or it was recently renamed the 15R, and I'm working on the eight foot continuum frame. And this system is $5,000. So a lot less. It has definitely come down in price. And you might be thinking, okay, $5,000 is just still huge. You know, that's still a lot of money. That's still a significant investment, but it's a lot better than 20,000. <laughs> that's definitely true. And also the other thing to keep in mind is home machines have started slowly increasing in size and price uh, to where, you know, I take a look at the latest, you know, kind of big Bertha home machine and they have embroidery modules and 300 plus decorative stitches and the price point is $5,000 and above. You know, they also have increasingly bigger and bigger harp spaces, which is super, super nice. But these machines are becoming more and more complicated and their prices are significantly increasing too. So, you know, we have these home machines that are steadily increasing in price and complexity, and we have long arms that are steadily decreasing in price and, in a way, decreasing in complexity too. Uh, the Grace Unique is very stripped down. It has needle up, needle down, it has a stitch regulator, but it's very stripped down and simple in comparison to other models that have a lot more features, a lot more gizmos and gadgets that, you know, all of those things do increase the prices. So the thing to keep in mind here is, and, and this is the thing that I wish someone had told me five or 10 years ago, is that this is not an emotional decision. And this is not a home machine users versus long arm users. You know, this is about what you want to create, how you want to feel while you are creating it, and how much money you have to invest in your craft. And none of that needs to be, you know, squishy. <laughs> you don't need to get squishy about any of that stuff. Uh, it's okay to say that you want to quilt bed quilts and you want to quilt faster and you want it to feel easier and faster and you don't want to have to worry about your stitches being the same size because a stitch regulator takes care of that for you. 
it's okay to admit all of that and be honest and truthful about that. And I've done, I did a post, this was a long time ago, back when I was just setting up the Crafty Cottage. And it was a question, this was long before the podcast, but it was kind of a podcasty style of video. And I'll definitely link it up so you can see it. But I was asking myself the question, am I, uh, am I making do uh, and just getting by? Or, you know, am I really investing in myself and doing what I need. And I had, you know, just gotten the Crafty Cottage finished and invested $5,000 into that little barn. That was the most I'd ever spent on renovating any of my craft spaces. And I had felt a little like, oh man, I need to, you know, I need to do all this stuff to make it worth it. I need to do all this stuff to, uh, to earn this. And I had been making do with the spaces that I had, how they were set up, how they were established for years before I gave myself permission to go and make that investment. And that investment has paid off a million times over. And that's the same thing I feel about the long arm. I resisted, you know, trying a long arm because I, I had this idea in my head, you know, oh, that's that's for other people or, oh, that's too expensive or, you know, oh, that's a totally different style of quilting. I'll have to totally relearn how to quilt on that machine. I convinced myself, you know, with all of these different ideas and a lot of emotional squishiness that uh, I shouldn't even try it. I shouldn't even look into it. I shouldn't even ask that question. And this goes back to the thing that I talk about a lot, and that is putting yourself into a mental box. And I don't care what it's over. I don't care whether it's about machines or your piecing style or pressing seams open or using yarn on a quilt. When we put ourselves into a box of limited thinking, we miss all the different ways our lives could be easier, could be richer, could be better. So keep that in mind too. Uh, I really love quilting. I absolutely do. And I want to be able to quilt for the rest of my life. And another big thing I got honest about a couple years ago, I want to make more quilts and I want to make them faster. I want to make more quilts I can enjoy on my bed and on my couch. I want to make more quilts that I can give away. And all of those honest desires were what really got me into long arm quilting because when I was being honest with myself and finally said, yes, this is what I want, I finally had to admit, yes, it was worth the investment. Yes, I could get that. And I didn't have to start long arm quilting for other people. I didn't have to turn that into another part of my business. I could have the long arm and enjoy learning how to use it and see it as a challenge and make more beautiful quilts. So I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. I hope that it has explained the difference between long arm and mid arm for you. Uh, I really truly believe there's two different types of machines. There is a home machine and it has feed dogs. And no matter what, that is a major um, component of a home machine and how it is built. And then there is a long arm and I don't care how big it is, how small it is, how massive the long arm is, how tiny the arm is. If it does not have feed dogs, then that in my opinion makes it a long arm. And this whole mid-arm thing is just confusing. <laughs> so I don't use that term uh, if I can avoid it. And I hope you can understand now why. So your homework, if you are looking at a long arm, my best, very, very best advice is to do your research. Start going to shows. Shows are a great way to check out long arms. A lot of big needle craft shows uh, and big expos will have multiple dealers setting up with lots of different long arms around. You can uh, get on the machine and test it out. You can also get to know your dealer really well too. I think that's excellent. Uh, now, long arms are different in the sense of it's a self-service kind of situation. Obviously, I'm not going to pick this up and go haul it somewhere to get it uh, serviced. You know, so this is going to be something that you're going to have to take on more things like adjusting the tension, cleaning it out, oiling the machine on a daily basis. You're going to have to become your own service technician and take care of the machine on your own. So that's another whole facet of owning a long arm. And I would say the other thing, whenever I first got a long arm, the very first thing that popped into my head as I was opening the box is, wow, this is big. 
<laughs> with a home machine, there is definitely mentality that I could pick this up and put it in a box and sell it on eBay if I decided it wasn't for me, right? A long arm is a very different situation. So that's another thing to keep in mind. It's a big piece of equipment. It is a big piece of furniture. It is heavy. It requires more than you to put it together. Uh, if you decide to move it and shift it somewhere else, it will require more than you <laughs> to move it around. If you decide it's not for you, you will then need to research and find a way of selling it. So keep all of that in mind and do your research and make sure that this is an investment that you're wanting to make. Now, as far as accessories, Brenda asked also about accessories and what extra things that I would advise. I'm going to, this might sound a little bit weird, but I would honestly say just the machine and just the frame is really a great way to get started because that is just going to force you to stay focused. And I know there's that tendency to kind of be like, oh, wow, you know, bonus accessories. <laughs> I kind of throw everything in at once. Uh, but I would really encourage you to just stick with the basics. Keeps the cost down, number one. Most accessories uh, are usually the same price whether you buy them with the machine or separately or later on down the road. Um, and it forces you to learn the basics, to start moving the machine over the quilt and getting the hang of that movement and getting the hang and control over the machine so you can focus on that. Now, if you know that you're gonna love ruler foot quilting because you love ruler foot quilting on your home machine, then a ruler foot base, that's a big metal, uh, usually metal or plastic plate that goes over your machine bed that widens it out so that way you have support for rulers, then yeah, I, I would say that is a good investment. Uh, might not be in the ferry, you know, right when you get your machine, maybe a couple months down the road, a ruler base. You'll also need a ruler foot and many times ruler feet are not included with the machine. So you need to keep that in mind. Uh, I would definitely wait on rear handlebars, pantographs, laser lights, all that good stuff because I think that your best learning is gonna happen here on the front. And especially listening to the machine, listening for thread breaks, listening, you know, and kind of getting the sound, the normal healthy sound of the machine in your head. It's really important to be on the front of the machine and be seeing the needle rather than on the back. So I would say rear handlebars, pantographs, laser light, all that kind of stuff can wait for a few months get the hang of it, you know, get in this and get the hang of it. I'll be honest, I have talked to many women that make this investment and then get afraid of it. Uh, and there seems to be a pattern, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, the pattern is they buy the machine, they're very excited, and I'm not judging here, I, I completely understand. Uh, this sometimes happens to me too but we need to be cognizant of what can happen and work to correct it. So make this big investment, get the machine, get the frame in place, uh, and usually let someone else build it. So if you're letting your husband or your son or your sister or your cousin put the machine together for you, you're not really learning how the parts go together and work. And I know not everyone is mechanical. I'm the girl that pulls out the drill in my house, but not everyone's like that. But I would encourage you to just be in the room and, and help out whenever you're, you know, somebody is helping you put the frame together because that's gonna help you understand the components better. It's gonna help you understand the frame and how everything works. And then if you run into issues, if you run into problems down the road, you'll know it that much better. I really do believe that this is a relationship that you're building with the frame, with the machine, and you need to be willing to get your hands dirty. You need to be willing to use a screwdriver and drive in some bolts and screws. Uh, you're gonna be adjusting your tension. I shared a video recently about adjusting tension. Make sure to watch that because that's gonna be something you're gonna do on a daily basis. It's a different, situation with home machines. It's not, we don't typically get intimidated by home machines, but home machines aren't this gigantic, right? Uh, I had a woman come uh, to my house. She scheduled a little private class with me and I, t I sat down and talked to her and said, you know, well, what do you, what do you need from me? Cause she already had the machine. She already had the frame. She had everything set up and ready to go. 
And the thing that was stopping her from hitting the start button is she was afraid. She was just, she just psyched herself out. Somebody else had set up the frame for her, you know, and she just gotten really afraid of it. It just seemed so big and intimidating. And so the very first thing we came downstairs and I said, okay, the machine's on, hit the start button. <laughs> and I just kind of crossed my hands over my chest and said, it's all you, baby. <laughs> and yeah, that class was just about kind of forcing her through that fear state and making her see that not only was it not anything to be scared of, it was a lot of fun too. We had a great time. And by the end, you know, she was quilting and making designs and her stippling looked better than mine. So yeah, this is one of those things. And I think it's, it's easy to skip over the psychological stuff and kind of how we can emotionally psych ourselves out about things. It's a huge investment. You need to be clear on what you're using it for and, and why you're buying it. But I'm also giving you permission to make that investment in your craft if that's what you want to do. And I wish somebody had told me that many years ago because I think I stayed in a stuck state for a really long time about this and it was really silly. And ultimately, once I got the frame set up and the machine set up, I was like, this is just a machine. There's nothing to feel squishy about. This is just a machine. It's not emotional. It's just allowing me to make more quilts quicker and uh, on my own terms with less, less push and pull under the, in the arm of the machine. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I do really love the quilt clips. Obviously you're gonna need needles for the machine as well. Uh, and I do use Mega Genie Magic Bobbin Washers in the bobbin case. Uh, the needles that I like are the Urs Grotz, sorry, it's always a name that kind of drives me crazy, Grotz Beckert needles. Right now I've got a size 18, yeah, they don't have 19, 18, size 18 needle. Uh, and I had to, play with my tension just a little bit. I found that the bigger size needle, which took a little bit of time to get used to, uh, resulted in fewer thread breaks, that I was used to using really tiny needles, like a size 8012, which is what I use on my home machines, uh, and had to get used to that, and it's been great. Now my thread breaks far, far less, almost never uh, do I get a thread break unless my bobbin case has run out. So I think that, you have to be willing to learn and experiment and try new things. And it took me a little bit of tension adjusting and fiddling in order to get those size 18 needles going. And then now I've got it all going great and, you know, don't have any thread breaks. So that's awesome too. So yeah, this was a lot of fun. I hope you learned a lot and you enjoyed this podcast. You can find many more podcast episodes at leahday.com slash podcast. And of course, if you have any suggestions for more videos, please post in the comments below or come and share your idea at leahday.com slash contact. I may just feature your question in a future podcast episode. Until next time, let's go quilt. One last note at the end, I did have an entire introduction shot for this podcast and it got deleted because I was having a bit of a crazy day and several different things happened and I accidentally deleted the video as it was importing into my computer. Not something I like to do. So I apologize about that. Be looking forward to an extra long introduction next week as we catch up on all that is going on uh, and exciting news from around the house. And don't forget, Next week is the pre-order for Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. That's going to begin on October 1st. So I hope you have a wonderful quilting week. Come and check out the new tutorials we're posting at leahday.com and freemotionproject.com. Until next time, let's go quilts.